Welcome to the Mastering the Game of Life podcast. In this podcast, there'll be insights around three key areas to mastering the game of life. Purpose, prosperity, philanthropy. Your host, Paul Lowe, the third sector mentor, is the founder of Hearts Global CIC, which along with many other of his charitable commitments has been responsible for positively impacting thousands of people's lives, particularly young people from disadvantaged communities. Author of Mastering the Game of Life, From Pain to Purpose, and Speaking from Our Hearts books. Introducing your host, Paul Lowe. A very warm welcome to you, the listeners. And as we focus this episode around the title, Never Give Up, I'd like to extend that welcome to Crystal Rawls, a life coaching counsellor from South Africa, and she's kindly agreed to share her story of dogged tenacity with us. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you, Paul. So maybe we could start by asking the all-important question, why should we never give up? Well, um, (laughs) I think... That not giving up is the only option that many of us have in life because we've got to live this life. And uh, if we if we do give in uh, to our natural sort of tendencies to to want to give up when things get too tough, if we do that, then uh, life basically ends or it becomes a very miserable life. So I've just found that that to to be determined to never give up right from the outset and to remind oneself to to never give up is is the best way of of making sure that you can live every day to the fullest because no matter what you're facing you've already made that decision to to not give up okay so if you can um put that in a more practical stroke experiential focus from your own life crystal what 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 does that story look like um practically yeah that's that's uh every day um it's that determination to to cling to your your strength your inner strength whether that comes from faith which in my case it does it's it's um just deciding to focus my mind on on being grateful and seeing what things I can be grateful for. And even though my my there may be pain, emotional pain, physical pain, or circumstantial pain through others doing things to to me that I feel are unfair or unjust, um, or if I just feel like life has thrown me a curved ball. Um, I, I then try and, and put my mind into that, that focus of just what, it, what can I be grateful for today? What, what is this in this situation? What can I s- learn about myself? What can I change about my thinking patterns? Uh, what, what, can, what makes me happy today? What can I be happy about today? And those are just little starters and and mindsets that I've found have helped me um, to take uh, control of of my day right from the outset. And I I probably have to do that on an ongoing basis throughout the day because there are many moments in the day where I then think, oh, I'm tired, I've got pain. Um, So I've got to just constantly readjust my thinking and um, I think with my faith, I, I actually I, I send up prayers to God all the time. And um, that, that also keeps me in a constant state of awareness that uh, I'm not forgotten and that there is a bigger picture. It's, uh, I'm, I'm not isolated in this world on my own. And, and that, that, gives me, that gives me hope and, and strength and courage. Okay, so in terms of putting that in some context, Crystal, can you give us insights into your life's journey thus far and some of those some of those challenges that have led you to you know to to come on and inspire people hopefully and add value by saying never give up I mean you've obviously got well I know you've got because we've spoken about it off air an inspirational story that that leads you to make those um you know, those three simple words of never give up. 
are you prepared yeah. to share that with us? Sure, Paul, thank you. Um, yeah, I think when I, I was, uh, I got myself through wrong choices uh, and wrong beliefs about myself, basically not, not valuing myself a lot. I, I got involved in, a, in an abusive relationship and then obviously that went further into an abusive marriage uh, with the same guy. And um, in, in this relationship, um, that, I think this is what toughened me up and also made me realize that um, if I am going to make it, if I am going to um, make every day count, and if I am going to survive every day, I've got to choose to never give up. I've got to um, find a way of making it through every day. And through this uh, abusive relationship, and as people who have experienced uh, any form of um, abuse, the, I'm sure that, that this, this can resonate, that um, every day you've got to try and pick yourself up and, and remind yourself that you, you know, you've, you've, there is, you aren't as bad as what you are feeling you are within yourself. Every day I had to look myself in the mirror and I had to tell myself, Crystal, you're okay. I, I got to the stage where I didn't, I, I couldn't stand looking at my, my face in the mirror because all that I felt was shame. All that I felt was disappointment. And I'd almost adopted that identity from the words that my ex-husband was, was saying to me, uh, calling me useless, calling me pathetic, saying that I can never do anything right. Um, I, 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 I believed that about myself and it was just resonating with a lie that I'd already believed since I was a lot younger. And so I, I, I got myself into the spiral, this downward spiral of believing that I was worthless, believing that I was a nothing. And I got to that stage where I thought, I don't want to live anymore. Um, due to my, my strong beliefs about marriage and commitment, I also, I felt like I was in this marriage for life and that this is where I needed to stay and that uh, divorce wasn't an option. However, this made me feel so trapped and I, I just kept thinking, surely I've, I've, either, I, either I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to live in this situation anymore. If I can't get divorced, I'd rather die or otherwise my, my husband would, be, would, would kill me through um, the, the, the abuse. And so I, I got to that stage where I suddenly shocked myself into reality after thinking constantly every day, I, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to live. And yet feeling like I was trapped in this marriage, I, I came to a decision through journaling and um, re realizing on paper, what my life actually was. I, I, I then decided I've got to do something about this. And so I made a decision to, to at least try and get out of this myself, emotionally and mentally. Although physically, I was not sure what, what was going to happen, whether I could ever leave. I decided that emotionally, I was going to get myself out of this pit that I had found myself in. And that's what led me to start looking in the mirror and telling myself every day, Crystal, you're okay. And even though I didn't feel it on the inside, just by saying it, eventually I could look at myself in the mirror. I, could, uh, I, I would not look away or look down, but I would be able to look at myself, look into my eyes in the mirror and tell myself that I'm okay. And uh, from there, the journey just continued where then I started building myself up with positive affirmations of things that I knew to be true. Um, changing those beliefs about myself from um, you're a nothing, you're a nobody, you can't do anything right, you're useless, to actually finding good points about myself. And this was part of the journey is trying to find good in, in myself. I could find good in other people, but finding good in myself seemed to be the challenge. And yet daily, just um, making this a practice of, of being very conscious of, 
of finding good things in myself as opposed to um, weaknesses or or things where I was failing or the, sh- the, the thoughts that brought me so much shame. And um, then just relying on, um, on my relationship with God, which I realized too had been so twisted through religion, through some of the things I'd, I'd been taught in churches about, you know, you, you, you're bad, you're, you're no good. All of those things started resonating um, with what I'd actually believed about myself. And yet you see now that that's actually where the battle starts and, and ends, actually. What, what I believe about myself, what I believe about God, what I believe about what other people think about me, what I believe about what God thinks about me um, is, is actually very important. But it all starts with what I believe about myself. Maybe from a chronological point of view, you alluded there to um, you'd got, you, you went into a marriage already feeling below par they weren't your words but that was my kind of understanding of what you were saying you know take take the clock back even further and and start to go back into your childhood and you know the the legacy of why you actually went into that marriage feeling so with 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 issues around self-deservedness and self-worth self-love self-respect and all that that you alluded to i mean am i picking up the right thread there crystal is that correct yeah, correct yeah absolutely correct paul i think that uh what when i was yeah growing up i was uh the second uh second daughter and i still had uh two brothers uh that were younger than me and um, I just felt very inferior to, to my sister mainly. And that all came about because my sister and my mum were very close. And they, they would often discuss things together. They, would, uh, they were both very outspoken. And they would always have the same opinions. In, in, in my experience, they would have the same opinions about colors of dresses, clothing, um, just friends, uh, topics, you know, of conversation, they seem to always be on the same page. Yeah. However, with, with me, I, I seem to think differently to them. And uh, with having the two girls, m- m- namely my mom and my sister, and then me, I thought, well, I must be wrong and they must be right. So I, I, st- I started doubting my gut. I started doubting that anything I had uh, or my thought processes I felt were incorrect and I judged my thoughts and my feelings and my opinions. I judged them in relation to my mum and my sisters. And so I thought that I was always wrong and that my opinion was obviously the incorrect one. And so I should change my thinking. And yet I didn't know what was wrong with it because all I felt and all I thought was all that I had. And so my identity was locked up in um, feeling like I was, there was something wrong with me. And I think that that belief that I developed about myself uh, through this, these experiences were then reinforced as I grew up, went to school. My beliefs about God seemed to be different to what other people had. My beliefs about relationships and uh, my morals seemed to be very different uh, to Uh, girls at school and so I especially with regards to to um, relationships with boys and and girls I I had quite high standards but I realized that others didn't have these either so I started thinking once again and believing there must be something wrong with me I'm I'm a misfit I don't belong and um yeah, there's, there, there was just a continual um, feeling that there is something wrong with me. And so when my ex-husband did come along, he was my only boyfriend. I'd never dated anyone before I met him. 
and it was basically because I wanted to keep my life pure and I didn't want to um, get involved in a relationship that was just going to be um, a fling or um, something that wouldn't go anywhere. So I think my ideas, I had very idealistic um, ideas and values and I thought that they were they were they, they were obviously wrong because the, nobody else seemed to think that way. I think this just reinforces, and, and you know, this conversation so many times, Crystal. And, and and why wouldn't we as coaches? Because the power of beliefs. You know, when we're on that track of a certain train of thought and these this mm. deep rooted belief system, whether that's right or wrong, because what is right and what is wrong. It's very subjective. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, I believe it's what actually serves us and makes us feel happy. And I know that that word happy can almost become cliched, but certainly from my own research and my own experiences of life, actually, it is as simple as that. When we, when yeah. we look, and this is my personal view on things, around who we are at our true core selves from a, from a newborn, it is around mm. the, the peace, the love, and the happiness that we have naturally. It's our right. It's our birthright. It's who we are at our core. And then as time goes yeah. by, we, you know, we get another layer of challenge, and then we get another layer of challenge on that. So we stick a plaster on, and that plaster has is is, is got a label on it that says you are. Um, you are, to use some of your words, Crystal, you are a misfit. You are inferior. You are no good. You know, you compare yourself with others, which is a recipe for disaster, as we know. So, yeah. you know, as we travel and as we grow, we're not actually growing. We're yeah. ungrowing, if there's such a term. Um, but that's the natural evolution of, of what what happens to us all, isn't it? To we get to a stage, I think, of emotional intelligence and awareness to say, well, you know, I'm not happy. This is not right. Whatever my beliefs are, they're not serving yeah. me. So maybe I look around me, and that doesn't mean I have to compromise myself to the way or that I perceive or the people are, or not as the yeah. case maybe, but I have a right to be happy. And this belief system that I currently hold is not making yeah. me happy. Yeah, it's so true. I always kind of revert then, Crystal, to, to Gandhi's seven steps that start with beliefs and end in results. Mm -hmm. and, and I've yet to find anything more powerful than this because not from a, a nice, convenient package and theory point of view, but when I make sense of my own journey and obviously speaking to a lot of people around their pain, their suffering and the journey that's took them from, you know, from that pain to, to a place of, of peace and love and happiness is it all starts with our beliefs. Everything starts with our beliefs, which then lead yeah. into our thoughts our thoughts influence our words. Our words influence our actions, which in turn influence our habits, our values, and ultimately our results. So what we believe is what we become. It becomes absolutely a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. That's such truth. So what was that golden moment, if there was, if, it was, if I'm not being oversimplistic, mm. Crystal, to single out a single moment or moments where you accepted, I wouldn't say realized because you probably realized on an ongoing basis that your beliefs weren't serving you from what I've heard you say, but mm. was there a kind of golden moment that said, actually, my beliefs are not serving me. You know, the winds of change are blowing. Maybe I need to adjust my sails. Yes. <laughs> There, there actually is a moment, is, is that moment. And um, that moment was, uh, it came through my brother, actually. He, um, he stayed with my ex-husband ex and I uh, for three months while he was going through a breakup. And during that time, he, um, he could see the, the uh, discomfort, the walking on eggshells, all of that, that was um, happening in, in the home. But uh, my ex-husband obviously could not be himself, which was to be uh, verbally abusive, uh, physically abusive. 
he he couldn't do that while my brother was there. So um, he got even more and more frustrated. But my brother sensed all of this. Anyway, my brother moved out. But um, it was about a month later that my brother said to me, uh, Chrissy, if I, as your brother, don't like the way that you are being treated, how much more doesn't God? And that hit me between my eyes. Like uh, uh, that was like the moment that made me question everything that I had actually believed because my belief in God was very strong and my, my faith was very strong. However, um, I started questioning everything, uh, uh, questioning my faith, questioning what God am I actually believing in if my brother and uh, has said this, if he would want to take me out of this situation, and if my parents or friends really knew what was happening at home, uh, they would all want to rip me out of that home and take me into a place of safety and love. And yet here I was staying in this situation, believing that God wanted me to be in this situation because God hates divorce. And it made me question my, um, my belief. Who do I really believe God is? And because God had been my foundation from the start, um, I, I started really seeking the truth. I started seeking the truth about God, um, God's character. I started seeking the truth about myself. Who am I really? Um, and this, this, this started me on this, on the search of, of identifying what I'm truly believing, uh, about myself, about God, about others. And so that was like my, my turning moment when my brother said that, that, it, you know, if, if he does not like the way I'm being treated, how much more doesn't God? And so it was that question that, that started my search on, on what, what is it that I'm actually believing? Okay. Did we share in a previous conversation as well, Crystal, around an illness that you have that um, that's, yeah. that's challenged your life significantly as well? Are, are you happy to talk and share that with, with the listeners? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, that was a really curved ball, if I can put it that way. Another, another thing, just when I thought, well, my life was, um, you know, it was on track, I was, I was um, out of this relationship. I was doing uh, work with, with the girls in Thailand, uh, being a counselor to them um, after they'd been rescued from child sex trafficking. So I was, I was really, really happy. Um, and this was while I was in Thailand. However, when I came back to South Africa in, uh, yeah, for, the, for a visit in 2011, um, I noticed that there was a change in my upper body. I couldn't move my right arm. And anyway, this, this never got better. Um, I had two surgeries, which both failed. Uh, I had a surgery in 2016 and then another one last year. So in one year, I had two surgeries and both of them failed. So uh, in March this year, I, was, I went to another specialist and then again had another op a, a second opinion shortly after that, a few months after, and they diagnosed me with FSHD, which is fascia scapular humeral dystrophy. So it's a type of muscular dystrophy, which is a chromosome disorder. So it's genetic and uh, doctors don't have any hope for this um, or any cure at, the, at this stage. So um, the condition that I'm living with at the moment is that I can't raise my, either of my arms uh, because I can't raise either of my arms higher than shoulder level, well, rib, rib cage level. So I need to lie down on my bed or on the floor to put my shirts on in the morning, to put my dresses on. Washing my hair is a challenge. I've got to bend forward um, while I'm in the shower and, and hold one of my arms to wash once uh, while I, I scrub the one side of my head and then the other side. Um, I can't, I, I, I can't lift uh, and reach for mugs or cups 
uh, on my own or otherwise I have to uh, support my right arm with my left arm um, holding it at its elbow to try and reach for things brushing my hair combing my hair the daily the daily things uh, even eating I've got to put my head to my plate because I can't lift my arm high enough without dropping my food on my fork um, so all of these, this has become a, a real challenge um, over this last year because it's just been a series of deterioration um, of my muscles. And um, so this has been another instance where I've had to remind myself to never give up, to just keep looking for the great gratitude, be, be grateful that I, I have strong legs and I keep the, those strong. I still do I go to the gym three times a week just for 20 minutes doing, um, you know, muscle, stomach exercises, core exercises, doing um, weights for my legs to keep those strong because I do depend on those to, to pick up things because I lean on them with my arms um, to pick up things off the floor or to bend over, pick up a cup of coffee um the little things so i've got to be I'm, I've, I've got to every day remind myself to be grateful for these little things find the joy in the little things and um have hope that if i just keep looking forward and if i keep uh, my mind positive and keep grateful then um every cell in my body will also naturally have to follow suit whereas the only other alternative would be to lose hope, give up, and then um, end up not wanting to get up in the morning or not wanting to go to work or not wanting to do anything. And that would obviously be disastrous. So it's either um, reminding myself to to never give up, to keep um, positive, to keep my joy going, to find joy in the little things, to give to others, give of myself to others, I can still speak, I can still talk, I can still laugh, I can still share and encourage other people. Um, and that is the greatest gift that I can, I can give of myself. And then another point to just remind myself of personally is that um, at the end of the day, my identity and who I am is not my body. It's, it's, it's within me. It's, that is who I am. And that my body is just the shell and the covering and that, that, that gives me hope because um, my, even though my body may feel weak, it doesn't mean that internally I have to be weak. Um, internally, if I am strong, it will help my body to be strong. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. Tell us if you share with us, if you will, Crystal, a little bit around your work working in Thailand with the, uh, with the young girls. Yes. Um, Oh, it's, it's, it all starts, um, I, I, in a nutshell, I can explain how um, in Thailand, the, the underlying belief that they have, which comes from a type of Buddhism that they practice, it's called Theravada Buddhism. And uh, they are, the Thai people are such peace-loving peace people. They are such devoted and committed people and so committed to their religion. Um, but in, in this type of Buddhism that they practice in Thailand, there's an unwritten law which states that for a young girl to make her best merit for her next life and to come back as something better, the best thing that she can do is to provide financially for her family until the age of 25. And yet for a young boy, all he has to do to make this best merit for his next life is to be a monk for three months. So there are so many monks in Thailand because these young boys can go into the monasteries and be devoted monks um, for a minimum period of three months, in which case they will already make their merit. They can get educated in the monasteries uh, for free, but for girls, um, they, they get educated free by the government up until sixth grade. So every, um, all, all children can get educated uh, free by the government up until sixth grade. So they're normally about 11, 12 years old. And then after that, it becomes the family's responsibility to, uh, to, for their education, to pay for their education. So in the northeast of Thailand, especially where the, there's a lot of um, poverty and there's, they mainly do rice farming, 
this is where a lot of the girls um, then find themselves in a position where they start to worry, as well as the parents. The parents worry, how will our daughter ever make her merit and come back as something better in her next life if they cannot afford to send her to school because then she can't get a job and she won't be able to send money home, which would determine her merit making. So this is where the traffickers then um, are, have an, a, an opening to be able to go into the villages and play on this belief that where the parents believe that they have to uh, do what they can for their daughter to uh, provide this money. So when the traffickers go into the villages, they dress up in smart suits and they'll say to the parents, uh, we can take your daughters and give her a good education and a job and uh, we'll, we'll take them and, and be able to provide this for you. But we do know that you are going to lose her on the rice fields, so you're going to have to employ another person to work on the rice fields. We'll give you money in exchange for taking her in it and so that you, you won't lose out on, on her employment, basically, as an employee. So they take her to the villages and then they in, into Black Bangkok or Chiang Mai, and um, they, they will then... Uh, put her into a bar and that's where she starts with her prostitution work, so to speak, because every, every bar in Thailand um, has the opportunity to be able to, for the girls to, to be, to be sold. So, um, or bought by, uh, by, by the, by the tourists um, and also locals. So this underlying belief is what actually causes these girls to be trafficked and also to volunteer to go and work in the cities so that they can provide money for their families, send money home. And this way they believe that they are going to be making their best merit and come back as something uh, better in their next life. And it's this belief that actually um, makes Thailand the world's top sex tourist destination. Because as we know, there's prostitution in every country, but Thailand is known as, the, as, as a, a sex tourist destination. And it's, it's this belief um, that they have that it's like a family responsibility that the girls have toward uh, and feel that they have to do this. They have to send money home and before the age of 25. So they believe that the younger they start, the more merit they can make. But their dream is still to um, find a foreign man who can marry them and then um, he can be uh, the, the supplier of the money to send home rather than them having to prostitute themselves. So um, it's once again goes back down to beliefs. What, what they believe has actually led them into this lifestyle of um, which, which doesn't, doesn't actually work for them. That must have been really challenging for you, Crystal, though, bearing in mind your, you know, your your moral code the way your formative beliefs were and all the things that you stood for um in the in the early part of your life to then go into that extremely contrasting culture belief system call it what you will that must have yeah. played havoc with you paul it it um you know the amazing thing was that i think after the experience that i'd had in my in my marriage um where I felt like I was a nothing. Um, I felt almost like a prostitute to my, to my ex-husbands um, from time to time. And um, I think I, I was so broken within myself, but it, it, it humbled me. That whole experience of going through that, that marriage, that abusive marriage, really humbled me to to realize um, how I had actually elevated myself uh, within, within my, my attitudes with my, towards people, um, how judgmental I had been. And yet, um, you know, these, these girls, their, their actions did not make them who they, who they truly are. The fact that they were prostituting themselves was all done out of a belief and a brokenness that they didn't even know was 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 wrong in quote unquote it um so yeah i had such empathy such compassion because i knew that 
after speaking with them and, and speaking, conversing with them and, and hearing their stories, that inside they were just as broken as, as I was and um, in, in my marriage. And that, uh, you know, they, at the end of the day, were just seeking for love in exactly the same way as I was. Uh, they were just looking for acceptance, approval, love, um, and, 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 a, and a good future. And yet this was the only way that they knew how to get it. And they would say to me, it does not matter how they suffer in this life. What matters is their next life. And so they were basically sacrificing their bodies and sacrificing their happiness in this life so that they could come back as something better in their next life. And so, yeah, they, this just, just uh, conversing with them, getting to know them was just such a privilege. And um, to realize that they are just like me, they, they just, we, we all are the same. Inherently, we all just want love um, and acceptance and happiness. And um, yeah, they were just, they were doing what they thought was best based on their beliefs. And I actually agree with the uh, what exactly what you've just said there, Crystal. Because when we look at the the insecurities or the the inherent beliefs that we have, or the fears, is probably a better way to contextualise it. For every single one of us is, and I say this consistently, around two things: one, we will never be loved, so we will to quote me, love, we will do anything for love, and the other one is we will never be good enough. And, you know, to have those fears within us, and we all have them to varying yeah. degrees, it doesn't yeah. take much then to kind of exacerbate that and, and blow it wide open uh, f from, from people that um, just, let's say, I've got ulterior motives. So what I'm picking yeah. up here, Crystal, and please correct me, I'm sure you will if I'm wrong, that your training, if that's the right word, of your experiences with your ex-husband were exactly that they prepared you for the work that then you was to do latterly with the girls in thailand would that be a fair assessment or am i wide of the mark with that oh absolutely correct paul yeah that's that's definitely it and i think um I, I a lot of my life message if i can uh you know sort of give myself a life message is is to say that nothing in life is ever wasted. Um, that every experience that we have, that there is a purpose to it. It's, um, it may not be good at the time and we may have made wrong choices like I did. I made wrong choice um, in, in a choice in, in the husband, but, and I have made many other wrong choices, but through that all, um, it's it, it, nothing, nothing is wasted. Those, those experiences, I think if we have, a right mindset and don't give up and we keep um, trying to focus on the positive and focus forward, nothing, no experience in our life, uh, no matter how bad it was, will ever be wasted. It will always lead to something that, we, that, that can benefit us or others um, in the future. You've used two words there, Crystal, consistently. One was purpose, the other was experience. Mm. I believe that purpose for us, okay, so, so let me park the experience. Let me come at this from a different, what would you say is your life's purpose then from, from where you are now? Because obviously you can only comment in, in the moment where you are now. That, that may change tomorrow, the day after, may have changed from yesterday, the week before. So if I was to mm -hmm. try and put you on the spot and say, Crystal, what is your life's purpose? What would you say? Um, I would say that it is, is um, helping other people, helping others to discover the God-given potential within themselves and to live their life to the fullest. Excellent. And that inspiration, would that, and I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate here, would that need to come from somebody that actually is living that life rather than, dare I say, and I'm not suggesting for one second that this is your story, as I say, please allow me to play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Um that, that's actually coming from somebody that believes in their purpose. They've been there, they've done it, they know what they're talking about, rather than living in this kind of idealistic philosophy of this is how life should be. But it's not really like that. But I'll, yeah. you know, I'll grin and bear it, stiff up a lip and all that kind of stuff. 
So, but to come from that real place of, you know, I might have a few battle scars, but I'm here because I never gave up and I'm here to inspire. So if I can do it, so can you. Would that be a fair comment? Definitely. That's, that is spot on. Definitely. So around life's purpose, is it fair to say, and I'm just going to park the experience angle just to, just a touch longer, Crystal, if I may, is it fair yeah. to say that having found or being very aware of your purpose, you then need elements of prosperity, whatever prosperity means to you. So, okay, let, let me ask, let me ask you, Chris, what does prosperity mean to you? Um, it, to me, prosperity means um, uh, knowing or, or having that, that sense of fulfillment and purpose uh and living living that every day that is that is true prosperity because that will then manifest in that that in a in a sense that you have of being fulfilled uh daily living life on purpose will then lead to um your own success uh well like my own success which would mean that i am prosperous in every area of my life so prosperity is is being um being complete and whole um and and uh, having the ultimate uh, being the best that you can be physically emotionally mentally um financially uh yeah in every area of 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 life to to truly uh be the best that you can be that's that to me is true prosperity in every area of your life to to um, be at live it to its best or have the best absolutely and and you are you know you are living proof of that because you've already alluded to crystal have you not around you know your the limitations of your your upper limbs your arms but you know the I picked up on the the passion you spoke about going to the gym for 20 minutes every day and you know working on your legs and your core your stomach and all that kind of thing it's like okay so I might not be 100% there but that ain't going to stop me in fact it's going to inspire me and fuel me to do even more with the things I can do absolutely no that's yeah that's so true okay let me ask you a final question around what's your interpretational perception of philanthropy oh um <laughs> sure uh can you expand on that a little bit more like what um yeah i haven't i haven't actually even thought of that okay yeah sure my pleasure um greek words for it are love of humanity i mean i think the yeah. the natural reaction when i ask that question Crystal, it's for people to say, oh, I'm a multimillionaire and I set up schools in Africa or save the elephants or, you know, these monumental uh, contribution, contributing projects, uh, which obviously are fantastic. But the reality is for me, it doesn't have to be that grand. Uh, okay. It is summed up in, in that Greek interpretation of love of humanity. Uh, it's yeah. giving back. And, and you've already alluded to it in your story. And the reason I, yeah. I've kind of took things down this this particular avenue is um, I'm constantly, constantly testing my three pillars model that's that has stood the test of time, both with myself and with people I've worked with. But I love to ask the question because it's about creating a model, I think, or a you know when we when we when we when we, when we come across people and, and have conversations, Crystal, is it not fair to say that? as a generalization people want a quick fix they want to you know just give me a solution that instant gratification give me a formula you know let me take a pill and it'll all but everything will be great well as we know life doesn't quite work that way in fact it doesn't work that way full stop but what i've tried to do my rationale for my three pillars of life which is around purpose prosperity and philanthropy is actually saying to people if you've got if you're aware of those three elements and you can work towards them in your life certainly purpose is massive um and you know having the pleasure um you know of not just existing with a purpose having prosperity in your life so you feel good about yourself and you've already alluded to that on more than one occasion and then 
Okay, so I've got a purpose. I know where I go. I'm going. I feel good about myself. I'm prosperous, whether that's emotionally, spiritually, financially, physical, fine, whatever it is. It's usually a you know some kind of mixture of all that. And then because I've done all that, I actually feel I've got the authenticity and the power to give back to those less fortunate. And so it, it becomes like a, a continuous improvement loop that goes round and round and round and just gets bigger and bigger. So that's why I come in at that angle, Crystal, yeah. to, um, you know. Uh, and I yeah, I understand that. And I, and I think my answer to, to your question would be that um, – through all of this, actually, through through um, my story, and to, which has brought me to right now, the interesting thing for me has been that um, my giving back to to the world, or my yeah, my feeling of of contributing back is is has been really minimised to no longer thinking that I've got to do something something great or something big, but it's it's more like. Um, the reality of being able to love the, the the person that I'm with, the person that is with me in my space right now, loving them well, and um, being like just loving every person that I come into contact with, loving them well, then that's more than enough energy that I can uh, I can deal with at one time if I'm doing it properly. And I think with um, what this my whole experience of even why I needed to come back, you know, to South Africa and how that all worked out, which was obviously only in December. Um, and then having to deal with sort of, well, what am I doing now? How am I going to give back now? What am I, you know, what, what am I doing? That was, um, it was almost like my identity um, had been, I'd taken so much love and joy and energy uh, doing what I was doing that I think in my mindset, I had also imagined that I need to keep making a difference um, by doing something major where, um, you know, I could see that a difference had been made. And so this year, I think one of the big things that I've, I've big lessons that I've learned is that that's what, what my difference or contribution to the world is all that I can actually do and do well is to love the people in my life, love them well. And um, that's, that's as simple as it is. And uh, focusing on that sounds so simple, but it's, it's actually, it's, a, it's been a challenge for me because I've, I've focused on it and thought um, every day, am I loving this person well? Uh, what would be the most loving thing to do for uh, myself and for them? And I think learning to love myself has been um, one of the one of the things that I've realised too is one of the best contributions I can give to this world. Because if I love myself well, then I can I've got enough love and resources within myself to be able to give that to other people. But I think uh, the you know, very often we, we don't love ourselves enough. And I know I most certainly hadn't. So I was running on an empty tank very often because I was trying to give out to others, especially in the line of work I was in. I was trying to give um, love and warmth and care and advice um, to, to the girls because they really needed it. But I was running on an empty tank because I hadn't realized that I truly wasn't loving myself. Absolutely, because you you know you cannot give what you don't have, and uh, I, I massively resonate with that story, Chris. Massively resonate with that because for many years, and it was about my healing, was exactly doing that. You know, it gave me significance, it gave me connection, it gave me certainty, it gave me uncertainty, growth. You know, it gave me so much to be able to give to others. The reality was whether it was time or money or particularly emotion. The reality, well, I didn't have it to give, but that process yeah. of going through that, actually, there was great healing in that. And yeah. to the point where my giving now comes from a totally different place, totally different. Yeah. 
it's yeah. um yeah I, I, t I totally resonate with that um okay so just flipping over to the experience element um as i say crystal you used two words very consistently and the second one was experience and i'd like to share at this point with the listeners uh, rupert spira's non-duality approach where he talks about the mind the body and the world and all and we don't dismiss these things lightly but all they are ultimately is experiences they come and they go mm. our mind however tends to hold on to them yeah and that's the problem is or well, that's the challenge isn't it because <sighs> The mind is a, is a mechanism, isn't it, for protecting us first and foremost. And mm. if we've had an adverse challenge or experience in the past, what we do is tend to store that somewhere. Right, okay. So if I come across, um, I don't know, let me just make something up on, on my feet here. If I come across a, a guy that wears a blue hat, red shoes, and he's got a pink handkerchief, uh, and he does me a really bad turn, and I see somebody again that that fits that description i'm gonna to have to be very careful because he will do me a bad turn even though it's a totally different person and it might be years later or whatever the change of circumstances are but my mind is saying no beware pink handkerchief yeah. or, or whatever now that's wrong that's absolutely yeah. wrong but that's what our mind does isn't it so i've got a yeah. I, i've got an approach now crystal of where I'm, my mind is my best friend but well. I understand these experiences and how Spira describes it. And I think this is, that for me personally, this has been massive. When we look at these things that come and go in our lives, that's exactly what they do. They come and they go. Happy experiences, sad experiences, challenging experiences, good, bad, indifferent, stick whatever label you want. But when it comes down to it, they're experiences. The one thing that remains constant throughout these things as they come and as they go is us at our core self, us and that peace and that love and that happiness. That's who we are at our true core. And he likens it, and I think this is a fantastic model, as a TV screen or a TV monitor. And as we go through life, if we imagine ourselves as a TV screen or monitor, we host that particular scene at that particular moment in time. So we might be playing a happy scene. Tomorrow might be a sad scene, but it's a scene, it's a script. It's like turning a page on a book. And what you've said to me, Crystal, you've turned many pages. In fact, I think you're writing new books now, if we can use that metaphor. Yes. But the point is, the one thing that remains throughout that simply is an experience, whether it's of the mind, whether it's of the body or whether it's of the world, it is an experience and nothing more than a scene that's played out on our screen. And that screen at its true self, at our true core self, is peace, is love, is happiness. And I think for me personally, that's been a great breakthrough to, to detach from this confusion and this stuff that's out there. And yeah, but you don't understand how tough my life's been. I mean, I was in victim mode for that and justifying that for many years. And that became a self-fulfilling prophecy in itself until yeah. I realized that just get over it. It's, you know, um, there's, there's people far worse off as there always will be. There's people far better off as there always will be. But that's not that's not the issue. It's around that acceptance, isn't it, of who you are at your true core self. And then putting that in the context, I believe, of the three pillars of, What's my purpose? Why am I here? Yeah. So it's brilliant. So, okay. So have you got anything that you'd like to add at this point, Crystal? Um, no, just to re-emphasize, don't ever, ever give up. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, you know, it's brilliant in its simplicity and some, you know, the best things in life are simple. It doesn't need any further um elaboration yeah. that does it really no that's so true okay right crystal listen it's been great to talk to you and i thank you for sharing some of uh, some of your life experiences uh, obviously for the benefit of the listeners so thank you very much indeed uh, indeed for that thank you paul and also to you the listeners for being part of this episode until the next time 
Keep learning and loving, and remember, mastering life starts by embracing our hearts. Thanks for listening to the Mastering the Game of Life podcast. Drop a line to paul at paullowhearts.com with any thoughts or questions you may have, and he'll be more than happy to respond. Alternatively, check out Paul's website at paullowhearts.com or any of his social media feeds under the same name. Remember, mastering life starts by embracing our hearts.